Uh, I'm thankful to get the chance to preach uh, last week and this week, and we were in Genesis 18 last week, and we'll be there again this week. The chapter divides into two halves, um, and I'll talk about that in just a sec. But let's pray, and then we'll uh, dive into God's Word together. God, thank you for your Word. It is truth. It is light. It is a lamp to our feet. It tells you what you're really like. It tells us what you're really like. It tells us how you um, change us and save us and then transform our lives by your grace. God, would you give us ears to hear? There are so many distractions that fill our hearts and minds. I find in my own life, even as I go to prayer, how quickly my mind wanders other places. Would Would you bring our focus clearly to you this morning and help us to hear what you have said as you have said it. We all have our own perceptions of what we want you to be like or what we think you're like. And they need the correction and the clarity and the direction of your word. Help us to see you more fully this morning and to live differently because of it. Please give Danny strength as he preaches in Michigan. Thank you for their ministry to us and then also their opportunities uh, more widely, we pray for Daniel and, the, and others who are sick this morning. There's lots of that going around. Please strengthen and encourage. Please encourage those who, who couldn't safely drive in this morning who are live streaming. Would you just use all the music and the, and the time of prayer and the time in your word to, to help us along as we stumble in our following you. Thank you for your mercy and your grace and your kindness and your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I know I've done something wrong when my wife says, did I miss something? She's usually pretty well tracking with, with where we are and why I'm here. She goes, you said that last week's sermon connected to where we've been. Were we in a study on angels that I missed? And I'm like, no. So I wanted to, I wanted to cycle back here and just uh, maybe connect some dots that I failed to connect last week about uh, why we're in Genesis chapter 18 these two weeks. Uh, does anybody recognize this bridge? Anybody recognize it? Yes, I figured many of you would. Uh, this is the Bear Canyon Suspension Bridge, uh, and it's in Draper. Uh, so that view kind of looks down into um, a bit of where we are uh, right here in Riverton. And uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with that bridge and, and at all you enjoy, you know, like easy family hikes or little trips, it's a great one. It's also, um, is it on the right side sunwise to, no, it's going to take a while. I don't know. Anyway, uh, you can probably do it this spring, depending on how much more snow we get and how soon it warms up. It's about a mile each way. And we've, we've done that hike, I don't know, three or four times. Uh, it is a suspension bridge, so it's a bit wobbly, um, but it's very secure, right? It's not one of those suspension bridges where you wonder if you'll plunge into the gully. Uh, it's a very, very safe and secure suspension bridge. Uh, but a bridge does something pretty obvious. It connects two places, right? Uh, where, where you've been when you're on one side of the bridge and where you're going. And that's why I'm in, we're in Genesis 18, because I think it connects us to two ideas. Uh, one is where we've been. And that was the first half of Genesis 18 that we looked at last week. And where we've been as a church from January in the series on what the church is, and then in February, uh, back in Romans chapter 12, is that we've been reminded of how much God loves us and how that leads us to respond in generous love towards others. So God loves us deeply. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you enjoy his love in an incredible way. And that should transform the way that we treat other people the way we look at the world, uh, our willingness to forgive, kindness, generosity. And in the beginning of Genesis 18, uh, Abraham shows incredible hospitality. And then God makes to him incredible promises. It's, It's one of those moments of God's love and our response of love. And that's where we've been as a church. But we're moving to a place coming up as Danny returns and in the coming weeks that I'm really excited about which is we're focusing on God's work, not just here, not just in our homes, not just in our local church, but to our friends and neighbors and to the ends of the earth. And so the second half of Genesis 18 actually reminds us that there's an urgency to God's work in the world. So we went from God's love and our response to that to what God is doing in the world. So that's the connection, and that's why we're in Genesis chapter 18. 
Uh, and that's why we're in this little two-week series on what happens when angels show up, which the underlying idea is when God and his messengers show up, there must be something important to say. There must be something important that's happening. And so we looked at hospitality and promises and God's love to us last week. Um, but we're going to transition a little bit. And this is why Wendy read from Exodus 34. Because what we see in Exodus 34 is that God is two things that we have trouble putting together. Do you ever notice that about people? People are complex. The Bible tells husbands to, to live with your wife according to what? Knowledge. Isn't it amazing to watch a newly engaged couple and the blissful ignorance that they live in? <laughs> if you've been married for any period of time, you just kind of nod and smile. You bring a gift to their wedding and you pray for them a lot because you're like, this journey is a learning journey. <laughs> it's amazing that the things that you love most about your spouse are the ones that also drive you crazy. Colleen loves that I'm a planner and then she's like, oh, you just drive me crazy in this way. I love how emotional she is sometimes. All the time. I love her all the time. There's this journey in knowing, isn't there? And, and as people who are getting to know the God of the universe, there's a journey in knowing him. And, and maybe you're here today and you're like, I, this is the first time I've been to church in a long time or I have lots of questions and I, I want you to know that the beauty of the Bible is that it unfolds for us who God is. And every single person in this room whether, whether they've already put their faith in Jesus and, and whether they've, they've known him for many years is still on that journey of knowing him. I'm on that journey. Exodus 34 is God telling us exactly what he is like so we should listen. He says this to Moses, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. What do we learn about God there? He's a God full of grace and mercy and abundant forgiveness. There's not a person in this room who has run away from God or rebelled against God or sinned against God in a way that can't be forgiven. That if you'll come to him with your heart and own, own your need of him and ask for his forgiveness, he's abundant to forgive. You say, Matt, I don't know the, you don't know the mess I've made. You know, I could take you to the Bible and I could take you right around this room and introduce you to people who have made plenty of messes. But God is gracious. He loves you cares about you. He's merciful. That's who God is. Look how the verse goes on. But, I could circle that word. But, who will by no means clear the guilty? Visiting the sins of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. God is not some divine Santa who just hands out gifts and wonderful things to everyone. God is filled with love, but he is also fully holy. We can talk about the good news of how Jesus came and died to pay for sin, and he did. But the reality is the bad news is far worse than any of us see or know. We're, we're much more sinful than even our closest friends know. And God is much more holy and righteous and perfect than you and I grasp. And when the heavenly beings sing before the throne of God, they don't sing, loving, loving, loving is the Lord Almighty. Though he is. They sing holy, holy, 
holy is the Lord. I fear sometimes that we have worked so hard to make ourselves comfortable that we have a short-sighted or one-sided perspective on who God is. And in Genesis 18, when God shows up with two angels to meet with Abraham, he says, yes, I'm full of love towards you and your family, but there's another side to the story. And so what we read in the second half of Genesis 18 is the reality, and this is not just true in Abraham's day, it is true in our day, of coming judgment and compassionate pleas. Look at Genesis 18, verse 16. Then the men set out from there, and they looked down toward Sodom, a city that is still infamous to this day, isn't it? And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised to him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, And their sin is very grave. I, this is God himself speaking, I will go down to see whether they have done all together according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. On page 13 in the chair Bible, if you you need one and want to turn there, I should have said that before we read. See, Genesis 18 not only tells us of God's love, but it also has a second truth for us. God is the righteous judge of all the earth. So we should pray for his mercy. This passage starts with a deep friendship. This is one of those exchanges that has become really meaningful to me, even in the last few months. This section starts with God and his relationship with Abraham. It's like they finish meeting and God finishes telling Abraham and Sarah about his promise to give them a son and Abraham walks him out. You ever walk somebody out after they came to your house? Right? The, the meal was done, the time together was done and, you're like, and they're like, hey, we're gonna leave. And you're like, hey, let me walk you to the car. And so Abraham and God and the two angels walk out. And Abraham walks him to, to, to where they're going. And then the Bible gives us this behind-the-scenes insight into God himself. I found this really cool as I've, I've been getting to know God in some new ways recently. Like, God is personal. Do you know that the image of God reflected in you goes a lot deeper than maybe we realize? Because this exchange right here is something we can all relate to. <laughs> Have you ever had significant news or something, something serious or important or great going on in your life, but you haven't told someone who's close to you about it? And in, inside of you, you've had this turmoil, like, I should really tell them? You ever felt that? So here is God and Abraham, and God says, can I go down to Sodom and... and do what I'm about to do without telling Abraham? Do you know what that reflects? That reflects a closeness, doesn't it? Reflects a friendship. God had to tell Abraham. He he couldn't keep him in the dark. Jesus said to his followers in John 15, I no longer call you servants. Because the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you what? Friends. This is amazing. Especially when you consider that that these verses we're reading talk about the holy God of the universe. 
do you know something? He is willing to be your friend. He hasn't kept us in the dark about what he's doing in the world and how his mind operates and what his heart is and who he is. He's told us. He's not saying, hey, just follow me and trust me on this one. He's like, follow me and here's who I am. And Abraham and God have this friendship that's close. Sometimes people will reference the idea that the only verse we have in the New Testament about Jesus' heart is that he's gentle and lowly, and that's true. And that's, that's a, there's a, been a great book written that a lot of people have read that's been really helpful, and I'm glad for that. But do you know we have a whole Bible of what God's heart is like? The whole Bible about how you can draw close to him and how you can know him and, and how you can walk in his ways and, and, and follow him. Some of us feel really far from God. Can I tell you something? James says this, draw near to God and what? He'll draw near to you. So, so if you're really far from God, who is that on? That's on us. Maybe there's sin in our life that we're unwilling to part with. Relationships, other things that we're like, well, God, I really want to be close to you, but I want to hold on to these things that I know don't please you. Well, no wonder we're far from God. Well, man, God, I'd like to be close to you. I just don't really have time to spend in your word. No wonder. Well, God, I really want to be close to you. I just really, like, I don't pray. Not a thing for me. Abraham and God have this close friendship. And look where it comes from. It comes from God showing Abraham grace. It's a relationship begun by God's grace. Look at verse 19. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after me to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Abraham was handpicked by God. God chose him by his grace. Does that sound familiar? Do you know if you have a real relationship with God this morning, it's because God has reached out to you in his grace. Some of you are like, I don't even know why I'm here this morning. Could it be that the God of the universe has brought you here because he, he wants to speak to you this morning by his grace? None of us have a relationship with God because we've earned it. We have a relationship with God because he's seeking us. Abraham's relationship we got with God we know was by faith. He had put his trust in God. Abraham believed God, the Bible tells us, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. You know how you have a relationship with God? You believe God. You trust him. You turn from your sin and say, I want Jesus to be my savior. I want to follow you with my life. God, I put my faith in you. Abraham knew that relationship. But it was a relationship that continued as Abraham followed God. Right? I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him. As Abraham continued to walk in obedience to God, that relationship just grew and grew and grew and grew. And who did it affect? His children and his grandchildren, generational work that God did. So God shares his heart. I wonder this morning, what is your relationship with God like? What is my relationship with God like? So we, we can all dress up and come to church and sing songs and la, 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 right? But is our relationship real? Is it growing? Is it meaningful? God shares his heart with his friend. But the news that he has to share with Abraham is not incredibly good news. By the way, this is one of the tests of real friendship. You know real friendship when you can share hard and bad news with someone. When you can share the dark and deep and difficult places of life, don't you? You're like, that's a real friend. It's the person who you passed chairs with today, and you said, how are you doing? And they were like, it's been a really hard week. So God shares with Abraham what he's about to do. Now, I have learned to live in a house of screamers. Wow. This is, this is a new thing for me. I'm not emotional. I'm like, super level. Um, so if you're like, you know, if you, if you, if you get frustrated by that, it's just kind of how God made me, pretty even killed. Um, my wife and my son are like this. 
They feel everything, right? So I'll never forget when we were first married, and I've told this story like a hundred times. I was sitting out in the living room of our little apartment in Indiana. My wife was in the kitchen, and all of a sudden she screamed. And I thought for sure we were headed to the ER. I knew it. I was like, she was, she was getting dinner ready, I think. And I was like, it is the end of the world. Because for someone to scream like that, they must have lost a finger. Or they must be gone. You know, <laughs> we're, we're headed to the ER for sure. I said, Colleen! I like jumped out of the chair. My adrenaline went from zero to 100. Like my blood pressure went up. I was like, huh. I'm like, what happened? And she goes, I dropped a fork. I'm like, but you screamed. <laughs> She's like, just a, just a fork. And I, I realized at that moment that I had to evaluate. <laughs> How bad is this? Right? What we're about to read is God doing an evaluation on the cries coming from a city. Read that with me. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Now, did God need to go down to Sodom to find out for himself? He didn't. Because God knows everything. But God is demonstrating his justice. He's demonstrating to us that he is aware. He's even personally made a visit because he wants to see how bad it is. He's heard the cries of the city. We know that these are distressing cries. It makes me ask who is crying out? And we actually don't get that answer in these verses. But look at verse 20. The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great. You know what that word great means? It's many. There are lots of cries. And the word for cry is the cry for someone who's in poverty. It's the cry for someone who's bitter with sorrow. It's the cry of distress. It, it's, it's the falling apart. Do you know God? God. Think of a woman named Hagar in the wilderness, ready for her and her son to die, just chapters before this. Going, God, do you know? God, do you see? I wonder if it feels or sounds a little bit like this. Because we know to what was going on in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah was awful. And crying out, children, the abused, the attacked. You know, sin always has victims. Sometimes the damage is done to ourselves. Often it's done to other people. And God knows and God hears. He heard their cry. The verses also tell us that their sin was heavy. That's the idea when the Bible says that their sin is very grave. It's, it causes grief. It has to do with weight and significance. We don't know all the specifics of what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah, but here's what we know. Ezekiel 16 says this, Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride. By the way, listen to if this sounds familiar, because we, we tend to think about Sodom and Gomorrah for one reason, don't we? But listen to what Ezekiel says. This was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease but did not aid the poor and needy. So who's crying out? Maybe the poor and the needy. They were proud and did an abomination before me. And listen how the verse ends. 
So I removed them when I saw it. Here was a place of pride, prosperity, heartlessness to the needy, and and gross and perverse behavior. And all you have to do is read into the next chapter of Genesis 19 to know that when two angels show up, what that town wants to do is despicable. And it had become so normal that it was out in the public square. And before we stand on our soapbox and judge a place like that, I think it's a good reminder to us that what happens all around us can meet those same categories, can't it? And even what happens in our own heart. And so God goes down to see, is it really that bad? I will go down. I think it's important for us to be reminded here that all of us live under the evaluation of a holy God. Every single one of us. And if we're honest, the same kind of pride, disregard for people in need, and evil can be found in our own hearts, can't it? But here, in this town, It had swallowed up a community. And God saw. Hebrews 4, verse 13 says this, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we are accountable. You say, man, Matt, that makes me uncomfortable It should. When we see the sinfulness of our communities and the sinfulness of our own heart, it ought to cause fear in our hearts before a holy God. Every single one of us will stand before him one day. Acts 17, 30 and 31 says it this way, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, to turn from our sin, to turn to him, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all. You wanna be sure that's gonna happen? Jesus rose from the dead. The judgment that is coming for the sins of people is certain. It is worldwide. Revelation 20 tells us it will include everyone from all time. Nobody gets, nobody gets an opt-out. Nobody gets an escape path. No, nobody gets out of God's judgment. But it's also personal. Hebrews 9.27 says it's appointed unto men once to die. And after this, what? The judgment. So it will encompass everyone in the world, and it will encompass you. It will involve me. It will involve my five-year-old son, and my grandparents, and my friends, and my neighbors. Jesus said in the Gospel of John that part of the work of the Holy Spirit in the world is to convict the world of three things, of sin, Right? All you have to do is read the Ten Commandments to know that every single person in this room breaks God's laws all the time. Of sin and of righteousness, God is righteous and we are not. Romans 3 says there's none righteous, no, not one. And of judgment. There is a day of accountability coming for me and for you. And if we really believe things like Matthew chapter seven, verses 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. 
then we cannot leave this room this morning unchanged by the reality of a holy God, of a people who sin, and of judgment that is coming. Jesus said it this way, flee from the wrath to come. So, how does Abraham respond? Verse 22, with a desperate plea. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom. So the two angels went down the hill or across the plains to Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. I bet he did. What Abraham had just heard stopped him dead in his tracks. Now these are people, if you went back to Genesis 14, the city of Sodom, a couple things that are important. One, most importantly, Abraham's nephew lived there that he was close to, Lot and his whole family. You probably know that. If you don't, Abraham's got a personal connection. The second thing is that back in Genesis, I think it's 14, Abraham had rescued that city when it had been carried off by uh, another power, another world power, another area power. So, so these are people he knew personally and these are people he cared about and these are people he was connected to. And no doubt Abraham knew it was bad down there. And even though God hadn't told him what he was gonna do, look what Abraham says. Then Abraham drew near and he said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? God, far be it from you to do such a thing, to, the right, to put the righteous to death with the wicked so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. God's mercy. Abraham answered and said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And God said, I will not destroy the city if I find 45 there. Again, Abraham spoke to him and said, suppose 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, let the Lord not be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. God answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. God answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. One last time, Abraham says, O Lord, be not angry, and I will speak again, but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. You know what we have in these verses? We have, we have a bit of a master class in interceding to God on behalf of people we love. Right? It starts in Abraham's relationship with God. In order for us to pray for other people, there are three, three parties involved. The one who we're speaking to, who has the power to help. The one who is speaking and the people that we're speaking about, those in need. And when Abraham really grasps the severity of the situation, his own relationship with God is secure. But he knows there's people I know and love in grave danger. See, God hadn't told him what he was gonna do, but Abraham knew this is gonna be awful. And so it's interesting that he stands before God, he comes close to God, and he begs God to intervene. He does it with humility and with reverence. He says a few times, I who am but dust, doesn't he? He does it because he cares deeply and he knows God's character. What does he know about God? God is holy. He will by no means clear the guilty. If we think we can live our lives in rebellion to God and somehow God will look the other way and just let it pass, that's not who God is. 
He's righteous and just. He will bring everyone into account. But he also knows the mercy and compassion of God. He says, God, will you wipe out the whole city because there are some righteous people there? Please, God, show mercy. That's why we sang, only you can rescue. Only you can save. None of us can stack up enough good works that God will be like, oh, those outnumber your bad ones. None of us can, can take our good works and cover for somebody else. None of us can do some spiritual act that will fix somebody else's situation, but we can pray. Do you believe prayer is powerful? Do you believe God works through prayer? It's fascinating in the day and age we live that the least attended of our church gatherings are what? Prayer meetings. There's always a reason not to go. If you're like me, it's hard for me to get up early. I don't live in this reality like I need to. Oh, I care about my friends and neighbors, and I I care about my son, and I care about the people who I haven't met around the world, but, but do I pray? There's a a funny story told of a pastor in the late 1800s. By the way, let me recommend um, a sermon to you. It's actually almost 40 years old now by Alistair Begg on this chapter, Genesis 18 on prayer. He talks about specifically from this idea of praying for other people, interceding in prayer. And that's what the whole message revolves around. It was a huge encouragement to me this week. And he he tells a story about a young pastor in Philadelphia. He was about 30 years old and uh, he came to this really established church And after a few weeks of him preaching there, this little group of people asked for a meeting at his house on Sunday night. That's always bad news if you're a pastor. People are like, hey, a few of us need to meet with you. I'm like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. Anyway, so this, this little group of three people showed up at his house, and they said to him something along these lines. They said, "Uh, Pastor, um, we're thankful that God has brought you to our church, but you are really young, And your preaching is not that impressive. And in the normal course of things, if you stay, you will likely fail. That's what they said to him. Then they said this, but we have committed to pray for you. And the three of us have committed every Sunday morning to show up and pray that God would bless his word and use it as you preach it in our church. And those three people started gathering. And as the story goes, that group became a thousand people. Praying and praying and praying and praying. And that young pastor whose name you may not know, some of you may know, is a man named J. Wilbur Chapman. He traveled with D.L. Moody and then with Billy Sunday. He preached all around the world. And God used him in that little church in Philadelphia that ended up not so little and around the world in incredible ways. And you know what Abraham does when he really grasps that he lives before a holy God before whom he'll all stand in account and that judgment is coming. You know what he does? He begs God for mercy. I don't understand it all and you probably don't either how the God of the universe responds and acts as his people pray but that's the response that ought to happen. I'm afraid too often as Christians, we look around at the challenges in our world and even the challenges in our own hearts, but we look around at the world and we're a lot more like Jonah than we are like Abraham. Look at that evil, awful world, those bad things that are happening. And we stand like the Pharisee and say, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men are. When we ought to stand with the publican and say, God, be merciful to all of us as sinners. Do we pray? God works powerfully as his people pray. One of my heroes, Hudson Taylor, used to say that it was one of the pursuits of his life to learn to move man through God by prayer alone. See, if you're like me, I want to fix stuff. I want to control it. I want to make it better. I want to 
I want to rescue. <laughs> I want to save. But you know, the power's not with any of us. The power's with a merciful and a gracious God. So really quickly, as we wrap up this morning, I just have three questions for you. The first is very personal. Are you in right relationship with God? I should say one, two, three. I saw my wife smiling, which meant did something. You know what I did? Try to add a little space in between each of the questions to make it fit better, and I ruined it. One, two, and three. Are you in right relationship with God? You know what? That relationship only happens by God's grace through faith in him. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are we saved through faith, that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, so none of us can brag. God rescues and saves when we put our trust in him. Have you done that? Not like are you in a Christian family or religious family. Not do you hope that you're right with God. What are you? Do you really know him personally? Do you know today would be a great day for you to begin that relationship? Christian, can I ask you, as you live out your life, rescued by the righteousness of Jesus, right? That's, that's what putting our faith, we get Jesus' righteousness. But you've been rescued. Are you walking with God? Or have you grown kind of comfortable in an area of your life where you know that there's sin hanging out? How is our relationship with God? Secondly, does the seriousness of sin, we all know the end of Sodom and Gomorrah, it's awful. God wipes it out. He rescues Lot by his grace, but he wipes it out. Does the seriousness of sin, the holiness of God, and the certainty of judgment, does it really grip us or have we gotten comfortable and at ease and distracted and pulled away by so many things that we don't live in that reality? And are we regular in our prayer, constant? Abraham, Abraham just won't let God go, will he? he just keep, how about this many? <laughs> how about this many? How about, God's, Abraham's not negotiating with God. Abraham is just, work, his, he's testing his relationship with God. He's like, God, I know you're merciful, how low can we go here? Can we, can we get these people spared? Do we spend time on our knees begging God to work? Begging God for our family. Begging God for our friends. Begging God for our community. Begging God for people all around the world that God would rescue, that he would show up in mercy. Let's pray together. God, these are sobering truths that we've looked at this morning, that you are holy in every way. You cannot be present with sin. You are righteous, and you are just. And you are the judge of all the earth. You will do what is right. You will not wipe out the righteous with the wicked, but you will bring every soul into account. God, if that truth has made us uncomfortable this morning, please let it make us more uncomfortable. Let it, let it push us to Jesus as the only hope, as the only Savior, and let it drive us to our knees. Let it push us to open our mouths and say something, even when we're afraid. God, would you give us boldness and courage? Even as we look in these future weeks to your work around the world, would that stir in us a, a zeal, an energy, a boldness, a courage? God, help us to know you fully as you are, not in some made-up imagination of our own minds. Help us to believe your word and walk in your ways. God, if there's a person or multiple people here this morning who don't yet know if they're in right relationship with you, would you bring them to, to talk to somebody? Would you, would you help the next conversation to happen that can open your word and share with them how they can know Jesus as their own savior. Lord, for the rest of us, make us sober about our sin, that we would love you as we ought, that we would pray to you, beg you to work, thank you that you do work through the prayers of your people. What an amazing thing. 
that you are a God who shows mercy and grace and forgiveness. But not if we don't come to you. So help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.